Our sermon text for today comes from the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're not taking uh, big chunks at one time like we normally do of a book of the Bible. We're, we're picking verses out in the book of Proverbs and gathering them into topics and studying this book that way. Uh, we have all the verses that we're going to use this morning, or almost all of them, here in your bulletin. So if you want to follow along with me there, you can. Uh, But I'll read them to you now, beginning with Proverbs 10, verse 15. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. These next verses come from chapter 11. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. One gives freely, yet another, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. Then from chapter 13, disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. Chapter 14, verse 21, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. From chapter 17, one who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Chapter 22, verse 7, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. From chapter 28, whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. And then finally, from chapter 30, the only prayer in the book of Proverbs, remove far from me falsehood and lying, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And this is God's word. Uh, we, we, are, we took a two-week break, and now we're returning to our study of the book of Proverbs. And uh, since it's Halloween, I thought I'd preach on a scary subject. <laughs> Money. I, I've yet to meet anybody who has told me, J.D., I've got money all figured out. I know exactly how to handle my money. Nor have I met any Christian who could honestly say, I have a perfect balance in my life when it comes to money. I I spend just enough on myself, and then I give everything else away to help other people. I've never heard anybody say that because we all struggle with how to handle our money. We, We want more of it, and we at least feel a little bit guilty for how much of it we spend on ourselves. We feel a little bit guilty for how much we want it. And if we allow ourselves to go there, we feel guilty about the great swaths of poverty, certainly around the world, but even in our own community. But Proverbs is a book of wisdom, and it gives us wisdom in how we can handle our money. So that's what we'll look at this morning. And I'll do it in uh, three headings, three points in this sermon. I want to show us from Proverbs, first of all, that money is good. Then second, that money has power. And then third, money has a place. It's good, it has power, and money has a place. So first of all, money is good. Money is good. There is nothing wrong according to the Bible, with having money. It's a good thing. The book of Proverbs makes it clear that when people live uprightly and labor diligently, they should expect financial prosperity. So Proverbs 13, 21, about halfway down in your bulletin, disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. And in the next verse, I didn't print it in the bulletin, but the next verse, chapter 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So the Bible is not opposed to to wealth in and of itself, and indeed many of God's people in the Bible were incredibly wealthy. All the patriarchs 
we read about in the book of Genesis, were by any measure rich. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob may have been the most wealthy men in Palestine of their day. Job was wealthy at the book, at the beginning of the book of Job. We remember that, but we all too often forget that after all of his trials and tribulations, Job is more wealthy than he was at the beginning. King David and King Solomon were both men who accumulated vast amounts of wealth. Fast forward to the New Testament, and we see rich people coming to faith in God. We see Joseph of Arimathea and Lydia, the dealer of purple dye in Philippi, originally from Thyatira, wealthy people. We read in Luke chapter 8 that there were women of means who followed Jesus and supplied his needs. So prosperity is the reward of the righteous, according to the scriptures. So God is not opposed to wealth, but neither is he pleased with poverty. One of the, uh, the first proverb on your list there, chapter 10, verse 15, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Our God is not pleased with, when people don't have enough food to eat, don't have clean water to drink, don't have shelter, don't have clothing to keep them warm. When someone is reduced to poverty, they cannot live as God created men and women to live, as stewards over creation, not slaves to it. Proverbs 22.7 the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. So when you're poor, some of you, I'm sure, have been in this boat before to some degree, it's not just that it's harder to buy what you need. I mean, we get that, right? You don't have enough money to buy necessities of life. But when you're poor, it's that even what you need becomes more expensive than it is for those who have more money. You know, in a town like ours, I think, that having a car is a necessity. I think Oxford University Transit does the best they can, you know, with the bus routes. But there are not bus stops all over this county. There are plenty of people who don't have means, who do not live within walking distance of one of those bus stops. So you need a car to get to work. You need a car to get to the store, to get your kids to their activities after school. But when you have a car, I guess in every state, certainly in Mississippi, you are legally required to buy insurance for it. Before I, I went into the ministry, I, I had a different career. I had a good-paying job, and I, and I had a house that I owned along with a friendly bank. So because I had that house, I was able to bundle my car insurance into my homeowner's policy, and, you know, I didn't like paying it, but it was manageable. Then I moved to Louisiana to go to seminary, and we lived in a seminary apartment. And when I went to get car insurance when we moved down there, I was in for a shock because the seminary I was attending was in New Orleans. And the rates there are much higher than they were in Madison, Mississippi at the time. I guess they still are. And on top of that, I could not bundle my car insurance policy with my homeowner's insurance policy because I didn't have a home anymore. And as a result, my car insurance rate skyrocketed. It was something like 20% of our take-home pay just to put insurance on our cars. Now, 20% of not a lot of money because seminary doesn't pay very well, in case you were wondering. But still, it was overwhelming. As many people have said, it is expensive to be poor. It is very expensive to be poor. Proverbs 13, 23 says, The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. Now, what's the, what's the Proverbs writer talking about there? This, Proverbs mean that, uh, this proverb means that when people want to take advantage of other people, uh, when you have evil people who want to use and abuse others for their own wicked purposes, they don't go to wealthy neighborhoods to make that happen. They go to poor neighborhoods to find their victims. Why is that? Because poor people simply don't have the resources to protect themselves the way middle class and upper class people do. It is much easier for injustice to come in and sweep away whatever resources the poor have. And it happens a lot 
more often than middle class and upper class people want to acknowledge. Um, years ago, there was a seminary student named Bob Linthicum who was uh, working at an, as an intern at an inner city, in an inner city neighborhood, very poor neighborhood in some Midwestern city. I don't know which one. And while he led these Bible studies, he met a very beautiful teenager, 14-year-old girl named Eva. She came to one of his Bible studies, but she had a problem. She came to Bob and said, I am under terrible pressure. There's a large gang in the projects that recruits girls to be prostitutes for wealthy men in the suburbs, and they're trying to force me to join them. And so Bob, in a, in a very typical, clueless, middle-class white guy kind of way, had no idea how these things worked. So he, he, write, he wrote in his book, quote, I gave Eva all the appropriate advice, advice I had learned in church and in college about how if she re resisted evil, it would flee from her. I urged her to stick with her Bible study group and not give in to the gang's demands. And then Bob, what did he do? He went away for the summer on vacation. <laughs> and he came, but he did go back that fall to start up the inner city ministry again, get his Bible studies back together. But when he came back, Eva was nowhere to be found. And he asked around, and a lot of people said, well, she quit coming about a month after you left. So Linthicum tracked her down to her apartment, and as soon as Eva saw Bob, she burst into tears. And she said, they got to me. I'm one of their prostitutes. And I'm just going to read, read now from the book. Eva, how could you give in like that? I unsympathet unsympathetically responded. Why didn't you resist? Then she told me a story of, ter story of terror. Well, first they told me they would beat my father if I didn't join. I refused, and then they beat him. Bad. Then they said my brother was next. He ended up in the hospital. Finally, they said they would do something even worse to my mother. I knew they meant it, so I had no alternative. I gave in. But Eva, I said, why didn't you get some protection? Why didn't you go to the police? Bob, Eva replied, who do you think they are? Now, I hope you know I'm not making any kind of comment about law enforcement in our community. Every single man and woman I know who serves with the police department or the sheriff's department in our community would think that kind of behavior utterly abhorrent. But we also, if you have any ounce of awareness, you know that kind of corruption has taken place all over the world at one point or the other. This is my point in telling you that story. I want you to picture in your mind one of the affluent neighborhoods in our community, you know, like some of the ones that we all live in, many of us live in. Do you have that neighborhood in your mind? If anybody tried to pull off a scheme like that in one of those neighborhoods, how long do you think it would last? In an hour, we would have every resource in our community, in our state, hounding those people to the death, making sure no one came close to trafficking our daughters and our sisters. poor don't have those kinds of resources. Injustice can come and just sweep it all away. One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible is 1 Timothy 6.10. It's misquoted as money is the root of all evil, but that's not what it says. Rather, it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Because money in and of itself is a good thing. It keeps people from being poor. And that's a good thing. But second, money has power. And it has power over us. Friends, money isn't neutral. You know, it's not just sitting there waiting for us to do with it whatever we want. There are evil powers and even a, an evil will behind our money. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But the old King James Version, which uh, transliterates the Aramaic word Jesus actually used there, says it better. 
it reads, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And I remember, again, my first semester at seminary, reading a book I was assigned by Richard Foster called Sex, Money, and Power. And in that book, he explains why Jesus didn't use the typical Greek, common Greek word for money, and instead brought in this word from Aramaic, mammon, when he said Matthew 6, 24. And he did that because he wanted to make it clear that money, mammon, is something manipulated by spiritual powers. Behind our money are invisible rulers, dominions, powers. And these powers, Jesus says, do not want money to be your servant, something you can use for your good and the good of others alone. Rather, they use money to trap you and to get you to serve them. There is crazy power behind money. And these powers do two things to us through money to accomplish their goals. And the first thing they do is they cause money to blind us. Have you ever been aware of how blinded you've been by money before? First of all, money blinds us to how much money we actually have. If you're sitting in this room, you are, without a doubt, in the richest 2% of all the people in the world. And that's just a fact. There's no way to be here unless that's the case. But do you feel like you're in the richest 2%? <laughs> Is that how it feels when you wake up in the morning? Man, I am one of the richest people in the world. No. You know why? Because money has blinded you. All it takes is for you to know one or two people who spend their money just a little bit more extravagantly than you do. You know, So you can say, man, I could never buy that house or I could never go on that vacation. And then you feel poor. That's all it takes for money to blind you. Money blinds us to our abilities. One of the most deceptive things about wealth is that once you get a little bit of it, it can make you feel like you can do anything. Money, if you get money, if you, if you are successful when it comes to wealth, then you start to feel like you know everything. You know more than medicine about the doctors. You know, about, you know more about education than the teachers, and you know more about theology than the pastor. And it can get to the point where if you have enough money, nobody can tell you anything because look at how successful I am. I must be right. And then third, and, and maybe most dangerously, money blinds us to our own greed. Proverbs eleven twenty four, 24, uh, about a third of the way down. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And then towards the bottom, Proverbs 28, 27. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. Money has the power to blind you so that you never even want to look around and see if there are needs that you could help meet. Money has the power to blind you so that you think you've got to keep every penny you make for yourself and never give any of it away. I, I was talking about this with someone earlier this morning. No sin hides itself so well as greed. You know, for example, you know when you're committing adultery. No one is surprised when they wind up committing adultery. Nobody ever said, oh, you're not my wife, you know. You know when you're committing adultery. But greed is like carbon monoxide poisoning. It's odorless, it's colorless, and before you know it, you've completely succumbed to it. It's taken over your life, and you find, without even planning on doing it, you're spending all your money on yourself. But second, so money blinds us, but second, money also lies to us. It lies to us. I don't think most people who hoard money do so because they want to trample on the poor or they want to lord how much money they have over their family and friends and, and show off. No, I think most people who want to get rich simply do it because they want to feel safe. 
And money lies to us and tells us that if we could just get our hands on enough of it, we would be safe. Don't, I mean, don't we all do this? Don't we all daydream and, and think things like, oh, if I just had that much, if I just made that much more a year, or if I just had this much socked away in retirement, or that, way put, that much put away from my kids' education, then I would be set. Nothing could touch me. You know, we all think as the first part of that first proverb, Proverbs 10, 15, we all think as that proverb says, wealth can be our strong city. You know, you get enough money and you're going to be safe from whatever this world can throw at you. But friends, all the wealth in the world can't stop cancer, can't prevent car accidents, and can't prevent a broken heart. All the wealth in the world can't keep your kids from making self-destructive, self-destructive decisions. All the wealth in the world can't keep you from being betrayed by other people. In fact, money may make all that worse. And to top it all off, no amount of money can keep you from tearing your life apart with your own two hands. We all know people, don't we? We all know people who have made a crazy amount of money and now they're miserable. And they thought, I'm sure they thought, they weren't trying to trample on the poor. I'm sure they thought, if I just have enough money, I will have a strong city to live in. But in reality, this money was a Trojan horse that these powers use to get in their life and absolutely destroy them. Proverbs 11, 1, the uh, <clears throat> third proverb from the top, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. In the ancient world, the way you transacted business was through using scales. Uh, you'd weigh the grain you were trying to buy or sell so that you knew how many shekels to give for it or take for it. But if you wanted to cheat the system, you'd use a false balance. You'd uh, maybe use a little heavier weight than you were telling the seller of the grain that you were going to use so that you'd get more grain for your buck and you could turn around and sell it for a profit. And if you were really good in the ancient world, you could very subtly put your finger on the scale and press down just a little bit so that a little more grain has to come on it to balance it out, and then you've got your profit. Money lies to us and tells us that no matter how much of it you have, it's okay. It is okay to bend the rules so you can keep a little bit more of it. About 15 years ago, there was a huge scandal in the Mississippi Bar Association. A prominent lawyer, certainly the most prominent attorney in Mississippi, maybe the most prominent attorney in the country at the time, pled guilty to attempting to bribe a judge, and it was foolish. This man had more money than he could possibly have ever spent. But he wanted to put his finger on the scale and keep a little bit more of it. And at his sentencing, Judge Glenn Glenn Davidson quoted William Barclay, the Bible scholar, to the attorney and said, the Romans have a proverb about money. They say it's like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. So we've all got to deal with money. It, it, It can't be escaped. Money is good but it's also spiritual dynamite that if we get it in our lives in the wrong way, in the wrong proportions, it can blow everything up. So how can we handle our money in a responsible, God-fearing way? And that gets us to the third point. Money has a place. Money has a place. Earlier in the service, Miranda read from Luke chapter 19 uh, the story of the tax collector named Zacchaeus. And a lot of us know this story from the song we sang in Sunday school. You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Zacchaeus was wealthy, almost certainly because he put his finger on the scale. He repeatedly overcharged his neighbors for the taxes they owed, and he kept the difference. Zacchaeus cheated people out of their money. But then we read, 
Miranda read, that Jesus came through Jericho, Zacchaeus' hometown, and, and great crowds were following Jesus, and Zacchaeus wanted to see him. So what did Zacchaeus do? He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Now, now why, I thought about this as I was writing my sermon, why in the world did Zacchaeus want to see Jesus so badly? He could not have climbed that tree out of idle curiosity. Jewish men of standing did not, in that day and age, climb trees. It was undignified. And, and that's true in our culture as well. I mean, imagine you know, if there's a parade in Jackson and the governor's watching it and he wants to get a better view. And so he like climbs a tree on Capitol Street to get a better view of it, and the news media took pictures of him. I mean, he would be laughed. It, it would be on social media in 10 seconds, and everybody in the world would laugh at him. It's undignified. So it couldn't have been just curiosity that got Zacchaeus to climb the tree. Zacchaeus must have had a realization. He must have seen that his wealth was never going to be a strong city for him. He must have seen that ultimately his money couldn't protect him from what he hoped it would protect him from. And maybe even Zacchaeus knew Proverbs 11.4, which is the fourth proverb on your list. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath. The old NIV puts it, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. You know, as we've said, no amount of money can prevent car accidents, can prevent cancer, can stop a broken heart. No amount of money can keep you from tearing your life apart with your own two hands. But even more than that, the Bible says, there is coming a day of wrath. There is coming a day of judgment. And on that day, we're all going to have to stand before the Lord God omnipotent and give an account for our lives. And we're certainly going to have to give an account for our money. We're going to have to give an account for all of our sins, including greed. And if on that day all we can say is, Lord, look at how much money I made. Then may God and I mean this quite literally, may God have mercy on your soul. I think what happened is that Zacchaeus had come to that conclusion, wealth is worthless on the day of wrath, and he was desperate. He knew he'd been doing things wrong, he knew he had to change, and he was hoping that this Jesus he'd heard so much about coming into his town could help him in some way. And, and then the most amazing thing happened, right? Before Zacchaeus could say a word, you know, he's up in the sycamore tree looking down. Before Zacchaeus can say a word, Jesus speaks to him. And what does he say? Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm coming to your house today. In that moment, everything changed for Zacchaeus. He had for years lived selfishly, but, but Jesus, as he can, he looked straight into Zacchaeus' heart. He saw the struggle in Zacchaeus, and he said, Zacchaeus, it's going to be okay, because I love you. I, I know what you've done. I know how greedy you've been. I know how you've cheated your brothers and sisters out of their money, but I love you. I accept you, and I'm going to provide you the kind of love and protection that money never could. And Zacchaeus is transformed. Money is worthless on the day of wrath, but Jesus isn't. He is all-powerful on the day of wrath because Jesus is the Son of God. He is the divine, come down to earth in human form. He had all the wealth of the universe at his disposal, but he left it behind, and he came to the earth to live the life we should have lived and on the cross to die the penalty all of us in this room, and most certainly including me, deserve to die for our greed. Jesus took that penalty for us, and he loves us and accepts us as we are in our sins. And as 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's what's offered to us in the gospel. So here's how you put money in its place. You see how your money will never be the strong city. How, 
how it cannot protect you from anything ultimate. You see how your money cannot be a strong city and that Jesus loves you anyway. And, and you've got to get the order right. You've got to get the order of salvation right or it won't work. Does Zacchaeus say, you know, when Miranda read that, does, did Zacchaeus say from the sycamore tree, Jesus, I'm going, he called down to Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to stop cheating people out of their money. And then Jesus says, oh, hey, Zacchaeus, I didn't see you there. Well, come on down. I'm going to hang out with you today. Is that how the story goes? No, Jesus says, before Zacchaeus says a word, I'm coming to your house. I'm staying with you, Zacchaeus. I'm putting you under the shelter of my wing. Before Zacchaeus ever repents of his cheating. You know, as, as Christians, the stereotypical thing we say to non-Christians is you need to invite Jesus into your life. But what happened here? Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' life. If you want to put money in its place, you must see that Jesus loves you and accepts you before you ever do a single thing different with even a penny that you own. You don't stop being greedy and like prove yourself to Jesus and then Jesus accepts you and welcomes you in. No, Jesus loves you and then you find money doesn't have the power over you that it used to. Jesus loves you and then you find it just kind of seems stupid to make money into your strong city. And to the degree you see that, money won't have power over you anymore. To the degree you see that, you can put your money in its place and use it to take care of yourself and your family, to care for the poor, and give generously so that other people can meet Jesus too. Now, I'll give some specific application here at the end. Zacchaeus found a, found a sweet spot when he met Jesus when it comes to money. And this sweet spot, I think, is perfectly, beautifully articulated in the very last proverb. Let's read it together. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. The Proverbs writer says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Isn't that beautiful? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? You know, like I did this all by myself. Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Like I said earlier, this is the only prayer in the book of Proverbs. The only one. And Zacchaeus found it answered in his life when he gave half of his possessions to the poor upon meeting Jesus. Now here's my question to you. Is that what we should do? Should we give half our possessions to the poor right now? You know what? I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I'm sure not going to do that. But is that the sweet spot for us? I don't know. I would be going beyond scripture by saying one way or the other. But I will say this. For 2,000 years, there has been remarkable agreement among Christians about the practice of tithing. Tithing means giving away 10% of your income. Now, I'm not even going to get into all the areas of disagreement Christians have about tithing. I'm not going to get into, should I tithe on my gross income or my net income? I've heard ministers argue about that for 20 years. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into when should you tithe, you know, every week, every month, every year. I'm not going to get into, can I break my tithe up into different recipients, you know, give, give it to like six different organizations instead of one. Honestly, those arguments bore me at this point. <laughs> the, all I want to say is this. If you meet Jesus, you'll want to be generous. And a good baseline for real generosity is the tithe. You know, some of you, depending on your financial status, you won't be able to give a tithe, not immediately. Frankly, others of you can give a lot more. But, but my only question is this. Are you even talking about this in your home? Is it ever even a topic of conversation between you and your spouse? Or if you're single, just in your head about giving double-digit portions, percentages of your income away 
to the poor, and to the cause of the gospel? Is it even a discussion? You know, do we really need all the stuff we buy? Do we really need all the trips we go on? I doubt it. I doubt we do in our family. You know, after food and to some degree clothing and shelter and transportation or our kids' education, once you get past that, most of the stuff we spend our money on is simply because we saw somebody else buy it first. That's about all the thought that goes into it. When was the last time you looked at your bank statement, your credit card statement, and said, is there any place I can sacrifice my money in order to be more generous to others? Because, guys, no one ever said on the last day of their life, I wish I had saved more money. I wish I had spent more money on myself. Nobody ever says that. You know what they say? You know what Christians say at the end of their life? I wish I had given them a little more. I wish I would given them a little more. Friends, when you meet Jesus, you'll want to be kind to the poor. When you meet Jesus, you'll want to give money away so that other can meet him, others can meet him too. And when you meet Jesus, you will pray that you will get neither poverty nor riches. Because as the old hymn puts it, you'd, you'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. And you'd rather be his than have riches untold. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we thank you for this day. I know it can seem self-serving as someone who <laughs> lives off of charitable giving to preach on money. To the extent my sermon has come across that way this morning to anyone, I just pray they'd forget it. You just wipe it clean. That, that's not going to be helpful. But to the degree, through your spirit, you're working in the hearts of people so that they won't make their wealth their strong city. So that they want to cheerfully, not out of compulsion, but cheerfully give their money away. I pray the words of scripture would hit home. And more and more, all of us in this room would be more generous and less blinded to and lied to by money. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.